Hello everyone. Welcome to Resident Evil 7. So, we are going to start with a slightly strange intro that I need to explain. Um, so, as of me recording these videos, what will be episodes 1 and 2, I actually have completed the game and I have recorded episodes 3 through, I think 11 is the main game. Um, and then the DLC as well, all of that has been recorded all of that is done uh so I, I actually really really like this game a lot but i had a lot of issues with my recording uh resultant of which i have ultimately decided to re-record the first two episodes um and this isn't even the first time uh ba basically when i started recording this a couple weeks ago uh i had to re-record the first two episodes and then i had to re-record them again and then I, after having like recorded the first two hours or so of the game, like three times, I was getting really sick of it and getting like very, very frustrated. But I, I did eventually find a solution and I decided to sort of just like move forward with the game and continue from that point forward. Um, so three forward, like episode three forward is that. And for the most part, the rest of the playthrough went pretty well. I think episode nine or 10, you'll see there's like a 10 second gap or something where I lost footage at one point. But uh, for, for the most part, um, I was able to get it going and I decided to just wait to re-record until now. Um, so uh, this is actually the fifth time that I'm going into the game. Uh, I, I also tried to re-record the first hour maybe a few days ago, like three or four days ago. Uh, and I recorded the first hour and then I actually realized, no, I didn't record the first hour. I, I had all the settings right. I just straight up did not hit the record button to start the recording, um, which <laughs> was really, really disheartening because I think I, I did it good. Um, so yeah, so what this playthrough is going to be for the sake of it, prior to my playthrough i technically had never played this game before but i knew a lot about the game going in um this was a game that i had watched multiple other channels play like before way before i decided to become a let's player or do let's plays or whatever um i, I really enjoyed other people's playthroughs a lot i think it's it's a really fun game to watch and uh because of that, this wasn't really a blind playthrough. I, I didn't know all the specificities of things like ammo placement or, or whatever, but I did know, like, the general trajectory of the game. So th this wasn't blind, but I'm also not really a pro either. Um, like, e even mechanical things like how to dodge enemies or... or like how close you need to be for the shotgun to work, etc. That kind of stuff I also didn't know. So like th th this thing of like th this weird middle ground that I was in um, initially had me thinking I wasn't going to record the game at all, but I, I kind of came across this idea when I was watching some videos. Um, you know, now that we're, we're in the months leading up to Resident Evil 8 Village coming out, and I, I feel like watching all these videos that in particular, we're touching on things from Resident Evil 7, I kind of realized, okay, there actually is something that I can sort of bring to the table. So what this playthrough is, what it's going to be, is something kind of like live podcasting or like live commentary almost. Um, a lot of people, when talking about this game, talk about some of its influences, like people will bring up the Evil Dead and Texas Chainsaw Massacre in particular. But like, other than generally referencing that, and maybe referencing the most obvious, like, big things that are, are clearly references there. Nobody really goes deeper into what that is, so I, I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to do a playthrough, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about horror, and talk about, like, here are some of my thoughts about some of the things going into this game. Um, some of the things that I speculate on are probably not actually influences but maybe are some are definitely influences some are like getting a little bit more specific into what it means for this game to have been influenced by those things uh so this is going to be more of like a podcasty uh, commentary sort of thing uh i'm not super super careful about spoilers so if if you want to like if you want a blind playthrough 
uh, I would recommend go to another channel. Um, but maybe if you've like watched Resident Evil 7 playthrough before, or you don't care about spoilers, this could be actually like a good one because I'm going to touch on some stuff that other people won't be. Um, so with all that said, let maybe let's just get going. Um, I've done this enough before <laughs> that hopefully this first episode in particular is going to be I think really, really smooth. Like I, I have my talking points kind of down, the things I want to cover during this intro. Uh, for the sake of it also, before we get in, uh, I am playing the game on easy. The whole playthrough was recorded on easy just because I, in, in not knowing what this style of commentary would be like or like what this whole experience is going to be for me, it kind of made sense to me to try out something a little bit easier. Um, I'm going to check one more time. Okay, I am still recording. Just checking OBS. Um, so, I, I decided to play it on easy um, because this isn't a skill run or whatever. When we get to Village, I'll play that on normal. And, you know, I, I played Resident Evil 4 on, on normal as well. And I'll probably replay that on professional someday. But um, let's get into it. Let's go. Resident Evil 7. Hey, baby! I just wanted to send a quick hello, and I love you. Oh, good news! I'm gonna be coming home soon. Yay! Oh, I cannot wait to be done with this babysitting job and come home to my loving husband. I miss you. Oh, I, I gotta get back to work. I love you, Ethan. I miss you so much. I'm sending tons of kisses. Bye, baby. You were right. I did lie to you. I shouldn't have. All I can say is that if you get this, stay away. Hey, it's, uh, it's Ethan. Oh, hey. You all right? You just disappeared the other night. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. It's Mia. She's not dead. She's alive. She, she's back. They found her? How? What happened? I don't know. Look, I, I don't know how, but she's back. She's back somehow. And maybe it's a prank. She wants me to come and get her. Where is she? Dolby. Dolby, Louisiana. I know, I know, but what if it is her? I have to find out what happened. One last check of OBS. Are we still recording? We are. Lovely. Okay. Welcome everyone to Resident Evil 7. So we get this kind of interesting, uh, peculiar intro. We have uh, one message of this woman, Mia, saying that she's going off on a babysitting job. A second message of her... Uh, saying that she apologizes for lying and she's panicked and she's saying stay away. And we also, in our inventory, have an email from Mia. From Mia Winters, sent July 18, 2017, 11.04 p.m. Tuesday to Ethan Winters, Dolby, Louisiana, Baker Farm, 
come get me. So, despite the second message, the one that she was recording all panicked in the dark, she has now said that we are supposed to come get her. So I think this is kind of an interesting intro. I mean, immediately after that, we then get Ethan, our, our protagonist that we're playing as here, uh, talking to someone else on the phone in, in this sort of conversational way. Um, I think one of the most interesting things about this game was that they decided to kind of get back to basics in a way. Uh, this is, in many regards, kind of a... It's not just a sequel to Resident Evil 6, but it is also kind of also a reboot for the franchise at large. And it's also kind of a... Uh, and it's also kind of a remake of Resident Evil 1 in some really vague ways. Because, like, there's this idea that we're going to be going into this mysterious mansion kind of off in the woods. Um, it's very gothic tinged. And the fact that this takes place in Louisiana really allows it to be specifically in a genre called southern gothic which is this whole tradition where like gothic literature of europe was able to translate itself really well onto the south particularly because um a lot of gothic literature was coming out of this like transformative moment in the history of europe when like the industrial revolution was happening and people were moving towards cities and away from these kind of like feudal rural spaces so you had all these like huge uh castles and amazing estates out in rural Europe that were suddenly falling into disrepair. Um, and that's kind of like the, the foreground of what um, the Gothic genre is about. It's about this like decay, like decadence literally comes from the word decay, as I understand it. Um, and you kind of got a similar thing in the South where like after the Civil War, when these enormous, like really resplendent Southern plantation mansions could no longer be supported through the institution of slavery, like they started falling into disrepair and became these like spaces of decay uh, and death and uh, this kind of, I don't know, like this bleak, uh, I don't know, darkness, I suppose you could say. Um, so that's what this game is sort of touching into. And I think the, the, the nod to the gothic genre is like very, very present, even within the intro already. So the fact that we get these, these like notes from Mia, these, um, we get these like uh, video messages and this email, and then e even a little bit the communication that Ethan had on the phone with his friend really ties to this tradition in gothic literature of the epistolary novel, which is basically like novels told through letters or diaries. And if you look at things like uh, Dracula or Frankenstein or a lot of a lot of the kind of classics of gothic literature from the 19th century, a thing that they would do in order to heighten the horror and sort of draw the audience in is like you want it to make it feel real right that's something we see in horror movies a lot too is to like adding a layer of reality makes something seem very very like more present and more dangerous um and one of the ways that gothic novels would do this was using the framework of like oh, this isn't really a novel. It's actually like a collection of letters or it's somebody's diary and we're just reprinting it and they're describing these unbelievable things. Um, sewer Gators. Sewer Gators, episode 17, sneak into a Louisiana ghost house. Schedule equipment, okay. We've got three guys in front of this very van. Join us, scrawled on the back. So the mystery deepens here. But yeah, th this game I think is kind of already invoking the gothic by way of having these like messages as this framework for the story. Um, and we're gonna see that a little bit more s relatively soon. Accept her gift, says the sign. That seems like we shouldn't go through here, but that is presumably how our surrogators guys got in. Um, th there's gonna be this found footage section that we get into shortly. And uh, the found footage was actually, like, released as its own little demo at one point. And that, I think, is actually kind of a really clever, effective thing with, with this that sort of connects it to 
southern southern gothic um because you kind of get it on its own mm. someone walking by so besides the gothic aspect i do want to briefly uh draw attention to also the southern aspect so as we come around the bend here we get this view into the bog into the bayou uh, for those of you who don't know american geography very well or e even if you know a little bit but maybe uh, not a ton louisiana is part of what is generally regarded as the deep south um, it's on the gulf coast it is uh directly east of texas and uh it's, it's the westernmost of these this row of the deep deep south states mississippi alabama and Louisiana. Um, it, the, the Mississippi River terminates uh, as part of Louisiana as well. So like it, it runs, the, the Mississippi River is the border between Louisiana and Mississippi. And uh, this has, this and, and other factors, I guess, uh, has resulted in Louisiana being this like very 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 swampy place it, it's kind of known for the swamp and the swamp is like a really significant cultural part of what Louisiana is what it looks like um, and it, its reputation that it is this like impenetrably thick uh, just tangle of soft earth and old growth trees and mud and slime and mold and uh, that's, that's going to show up a little bit thematically in this game, but it, it's often been like an especially fertile space for horror um, because swamps are so kind of like disconnected from the rest of the world. They're really, really difficult to access. A lot of vehicles that can go basically everywhere else can't go through swamps like very, very often um, like boats, like regular boats can't actually pass through swamp waters. Um, because the swamp is either too shallow or there's like too much vegetation in the water for a submerged propeller to cut through. Um, and like very often the ground is too soft for even land vehicles, like normal land vehicles to go on. So it is this kind of like hyper inaccessible place with all these like old growth trees and things. Um, Louisiana is also really interesting as a setting because like it, it has a pretty culturally distinct um, flavor to it famously this is where uh new orleans is and there's this huge like french empire influence lingering like louisiana was like the seat of french power in the new world so um the lingering french influence is is very very present in louisiana and like still very very relevant to culture here um I'm not in Louisiana, but I mean here as in where Ethan is. So, real quick, as we have uh, passed some carrying carcasses being picked at by crows, we've encountered what I think is one of the earlier, earliest movie references. So we have Texas Chainsaw Massacre is going to be something I'm going to reference a lot in this and other videos. I think it's like a gigantic influence on this game. I actually think it's maybe a bigger influence than The Evil Dead, even though The Evil Dead constantly gets brought up in like interviews and like fact videos people always reference that over texas chainsaw massacre but this like bizarre architecture made of animal parts is or human parts i guess maybe this this one in particular is obviously animal parts but i mean like architecture made of bits is very texas chainsaw massacre um all of this thing with the like elaborate rope hangings from the trees with these circular saw blades is also very texas chainsaw massacre when uh when the hippies are approaching the house for the first time in texas chainsaw massacre they actually pass by this tree uh that's full of stuff hanging from ropes so there's actually like a tea kettle uh there's a, a stop watch that has um like a tent stake driven through it um and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I think, among many other things, connects to this because it's also in the South. As I mentioned, like Texas is relatively close to Louisiana. Um, they actually mention the fact that Louisiana isn't far away in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And this is actually fairly close to the border of Texas, where, or at least I think it's implied to be. Uh, we're, we'll have that come up 
soon. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre also uh, does the pseudo epistolary thing um, where it kind of like pretends to be realer than it actually is. It has this opening text crawl that claims that the film is um, or is, it sort of loosely implies that the film is based on something real. This also looks like the house, the, uh, the abandoned house that the brother and sister go to in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, speaking of which, oh, a driver's license. Mia, her Texas driver's license. <laughs> uh, real quick, I want to make note of something before we move into this next area. So, this bag looks really great, right? Um, one of the things that's really interesting about the production of this game is that they used a lot of photogrammetry, as I understand it, for, for its production. For those of you who don't know uh, game production terms or, or CGI production terms, uh, photogrammetry is this process where you take an object and you have it photographed by like regular still film cameras from like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of angles. Um, and then a computer program is able to combine all those photos or sort of like use all those photos and interpret them to create a 3D model. So like we get these really, really good static 3D models in the game. And uh, I bring that up for a specific reason that we'll get to momentarily, but uh, it lends a level of realism that I guess connects with a lot of these things I've been talking about, but it also um, will draw attention to some of the things that maybe aren't photogrammetry so one of the things that has that, that, that stood out to me when I was, I was watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre in advance of playing this game because I wanted to do a little research. I, w I watched a few horror movies, actually. Um, but this is not a very good 3D model. Like, if we get close to it, you can see that, like, the boards are, like, super, super simple and you have these kind of, like, bad stakes and like the boards are like perfect rectangular projections or like the the big um beams are uh, and then the crossbars on top are a little bit more detailed but not much it's it's not a very um really meticulously made model and i think that's because they didn't have an original object to scan um when they made this and i think the reason that they didn't have something to scan is because this is actually maybe based on a prop or a, a thing, also from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So if, if you watch that film, uh, when they approach the Sawyer house, which is like the, the house of the, the bad guys, the psychos or whatever, um, th there's a A-frame swing bench just like this, like exact scale, exact shape, um, exact construction outside that house um, which I think is like really weirdly specific because like you have this big covered porch um, that seems like the perfect spot to have like a porch swing but they, they specifically designed this one to be out here which again feels like this object that maybe when they were all as a team looking at Texas Chainsaw Massacre they might have uh might have borrowed that they might have said like hey let's do this thing you know from the movie so into the house we go looking for mia so we get this thing of all this decay all of this falling apart again very much in the southern gothic tradition um this idea of what was once probably really quite nice just completely falling apart. Um, hmm. So we need something to cut the chains. Before I go further, I just want to read you all the, uh, the text from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre opening. The film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths, in particular Sally Hardesty and her invalid brother Franklin. It is all the more tragic in that they were young, but had they lived very, very long lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see that day. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon drive became a nightmare. 
The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So although it doesn't say based on a true story in literal words, there's something about like the nature of how it's described, like the idea of like they're about to like trip upon something that is like historic. Like it's it's sort of playing with the implication that something is is somewhat realistic. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that movie throughout the playthrough. There's a lot to be said about this thing, this back and forth with consuming and being consumed. Um, locks drawer there. In this drawer, we got a photo of a little girl in a hallway. <clears throat> and we have a kitchen full of gross food. But uh, with, with that consume and c consuming and consumer. Oh, oh fuck. sorry. You just heard my controller vibrate. Because uh, it uh, was plugged in and I am playing this with a keyboard and mouse. So it was on my table. Um, the fact that we start in a kitchen when we first enter into the house is, I think, non-coincidental. Like the idea that like this is immediately kind of pointing to this cannibal thing, to this like the the violence of consumption is very very present. That's also a theme in a lot of horror movies and a lot of gothic fiction with with vampires, with zombies, with werewolves. The idea of like biting, the idea of consuming, the idea of all of these things. We got a crow in a microwave. We got the gross pot. Um, this idea of consuming and, and this grossness, I think, is also really, really well fit to Louisiana because Louisiana is, as part of this extended legacy coming from France, as well as uh, the influence of many peoples who would occupy uh, Louisiana. Um, or, or be brought into Louisiana, whether it was the uh, the labor of indigenous peoples, the labor of enslaved people. Um, all of these influences have led to like a really, really strong culinary culture in the South. Uh, what you what you often get talked about as being Cajun cuisine, Creole cuisine. Um, these these things are. Are really crucial to the character of Louisiana and I think it's sort of funny that this is a, a Japanese American co-production as a game and, and set in Louisiana um, there, there's I think it was Anthony Bourdain who uh, has a quote where he basically said like tons and tons of cultures around the world pride themselves on being like food cultures like they really say that they love food they're all about food food is so important to the family food is so important to uh, gathering and and celebrations and whatever but he, he basically argued that like although that is true there's two places in the world that like are above all others like on their own tier of absolute like obsessive commitment and devotion to food and the two places were japan and louisiana um so being a japanese game set in louisiana and we're already in this kitchen is is very uh, funny. Over 20 missing in two years, says the Dolby Daily. Now, I can't actually read the text there because um, one, one of my workarounds to get the recording to work is that I actually need to like blow out the gamma on my side, which is basically making my screen very, very, very white. Um, so, unfortunately, I don't get to experience how beautiful and grotesque this game can be. Um, but, you know, you all get to, the recording is better, uh, even if my end of it is not as good. I'm going to draw full of mold over here, um, which is unfortunate, but, um, I, I bring that up in that moment because I couldn't read the newspaper really. Um, one thing I've frequently... I think it's this newspaper, but one thing I've heard mentioned is that there's a few references to the Resident Evil, um, what are they called, Outbreak games, File 1, File 2, the PlayStation 2 um, multiplayer Resident Evil games. Um, and I believe that that newspaper article was implied to have been written by a character in that game. Uh, derelict house footage, says the VHS tape. Well, how will we ever 
know what's on the VHS tape. Who has a VHS tape player in this day and age? Um, here's my recording from the other day for the sake of saying it. Um, when I had to completely, completely uh, kick myself for failing to hit the record button when doing my fourth recording of the intro. And now we're on to recording number five. Um, but uh, continuing forward, this isn't really that significant to the overall game thematically or conceptually, but uh, in, in a lot of the playthroughs that I've seen, in fact, basically maybe in every playthrough I've seen of this game, pe people always stop and look at this painting and, and make note of it. And they're like, oh, that's so weird. It's a painting of a woman with a bag over her head. Uh, I, I want to draw attention to this, actually. I, I have a theory where it might come from. I mean, on the one hand, it could be a horror reference, and it could be, like, it could be Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It could be Jason from uh, Friday the 13th Part 2, because that's before he got the hockey mask, and the second one, he wears a burlap sack over his head. Um, and there's a lot of horror villains who wear sacks over their heads. Um, but, no, I, I actually think... Or I guess my, my initial impression of this when when I have seen it so many times is uh, I'm immediately reminded of René Magritte, who is a uh, surrealist painter from the earlier 20th century. You all have probably seen his paintings before. He's famous for this painting uh, called The Treachery of Images, which is a painting of a pipe, and it says in cursive, below it's in a paun pipe, which is, uh, this is not a pipe, because it's not a pipe, it's a painting of a pipe, um, or an image of a pipe, I should say. Um, he also does these paintings of guys wearing like bowler hats and trench coats and they have an apple floating in front of their face and very often they're like flying into the sky kind of. Uh, he's also really, really famous for paintings of people with bags over their heads. Uh, some of his most famous paintings, there, there's one in particular called The Lovers, which is two people, uh, two people with bags over their heads kissing each other through the bags. Um, it is sort of horror adjacent if only because at least apocryphally, there is this legend that he that that image comes from this kind of like traumatic incident, where allegedly, uh, I believe his mother committed suicide, and he, as a child, found her body um, in the bathtub, and she had a, a washcloth over her face, um, and allegedly that was. If that is an event that happened, it was an image, obviously, that would have stayed with him for the rest of his life. Um, and I, th th there's something about the painting that really makes me think that it might be a, a Magritte reference, because he's a, a big, well-known artist. So we've got another photo. This is our second photo. The first one is of a creepy girl down a hall, and now this is of maybe our girlfriend, Mia. Then we got another one of some bare legs in a bed being approached by a mysterious figure hmm. and we have a third photo of a jail cell with a bed in it very strange quickly to uh oh and we have a photo of the family looks like the owners um quickly to draw back to the the first photo we found um i do want to give an advanced notice to the fact that two of the big influences to this playthrough like two of the the texts that uh I, I was thinking about a lot going into this were these two books uh one is an older slightly older book called men women and chainsaws by carol j clover which is talking about gender and horror and then uh one is skin shows by judith halverstrom um which is sort of about it's about a lot of things but it's about it largely is looking at skin in horror uh and like gothic gothic storytelling specifically oh i should also check the fuse box it's missing a fuse box or it's missing a fuse and we can see that that's the one for the stairs which must be the button we pushed upstairs um to go up to the attic uh the photo of the child strikes me as like an immediate invocation of uh, this concept that Carol J. Clover has called 
uh, white science versus black magic. And it's this idea that like in horror, very often you get this thing of like this dichotomy of like, of where like safety is placed or like where order is placed and then where the supernatural is placed opposite it. And like, order or safety or like the norm or something like the audience is sort of positioned in um is usually associated with like cities specifically um and white people and men and straightness and adults and able-bodiedness um whereas the other other ring otherness um supernatural phenomenon are often connected with everything that kind of isn't that um, so it's people of color, it's children, it's elderly people, it's women, it's um, people in rural spaces. Um, this is like a, a theme that like passes through a lot of human history that like we're afraid of like scary country people and children are creepy. Like children have some capacity to speak with ghosts or elderly people are scary. They have... Uh, forbidden knowledge from their long lives um, or women have some uh, connection with nature that men do not have uh, th these themes um, people of color being more connected to nature um, rural people having some kind of connection to these forbidden phenomenon that have been forgotten by the civilized world uh, so to speak is uh, a big idea so right off the bat we we got that picture of a creepy little girl in a hallway and i'm kind of reminded of that carol j clover talking point which i think will show up throughout this but conveniently enough in this 2017 house there is in fact a vhs player and we have access to clancy javis's june 1st 2017 so it's about six weeks earlier abandoned house derelict house june one footage for the sewer gators recording crew I only work with professionals. Speaking of which, make sure the sound is right this time. I don't want a repeat of Amarillo. That was two fucking years ago. I don't do ADR. I've heard people ask what ADR is. Okay. That's recording audio after the fact, basically. Just don't be surprised if we have so, to make a change. Here we are after the house, or her outside the house. We do a walk through the inside first, then we shoot the intro, just like we always do. Just try to say the show's name this time, okay? No problem. Tonight on the Sewer Gators, another worthless fucking shit. Happy? Ecstatic. Hmm. So this was the demo that I mentioned. Um, th th this was like a playable thing unto itself as this like side chapter that they actually wove into the game. Um, though in the demo, you have the ability to like see ghosts basically. Um, like you would get like if you looked in certain directions at at the right moment in just a few certain places um a specter of mia would show up which isn't really a spoiler it doesn't i mean it doesn't show up in the final game but like people who had played that demo would have been very wary of mia if they saw her in the demo at least I was an anchor, you know? We can sub, Pete. Not anchor. What's that? Nothing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a good joke. Yeah, one, one of them that I'm familiar with was that, like, during that talk, if you had looked back, Mia would have been, like, upside down, like, floating in this space, looking at you. Very, like, PT. How long do you say this place has been abandoned? Three years. <coughs> Still locked. Make a great cutaway. So, uh, Hillbilly Joe and his family go missing. Not Hillbillies, the Bakers. Jack and Marguerite Baker. And they were quiet, not backward. A lot of bad rumors about their son, Lucas. Bad seat, apparently. Ah, shit! I know I should have worn my good shoes. Oh, shit. No photo in the drawer yet. Glad I had my shots. Although... This make a great backdrop. Andre, what do you think? No crow in the microwave Andre. yet. Sink maybe looks a little less full. Andre! Andre! Clancy, you see 
see where Andre went? So the found footage thing is really kind of cool to me. This contributes to the whole what? epistolary what? thing. Believe like the idea of like, here's this like this recorded message that we've come I mean, upon. They come and go, but a, a good cameraman like you, Clancy, you stick with me. Still full of mold. Um, most people, when they think about the this genre, the found footage thing, People, people have a tendency to think about Blair Witch Project, which certainly popularized it and, like, was also doing this kind of, like, epistolary thing of, like... I mean, epistolary technically means, I think, by letters, but so, I don't know, found media, found writing, like, oh, here's this thing that existed um, without, you know, without an author. Here's this, like, you know, object of information that we found. What the fuck was that? Did you hear that? Blair Witch really popularized it Andre? and led to this whole wave of these. And I think that that influenced this section a little bit, the idea of the found footage horror. Uh, Andre, where are you, man? Later on, you would also get, like, Wreck, of course. George Romero also did his own take on it with Diary of the Dead. Still missing the fuse. Clancy doesn't know how to play piano, apparently. What the hell? But, uh... Even though people associate... You gotta be fucking kidding me. Hmm. Even though people associate... All right, new deal. Oh, looks like the people Andre was talking we about. Find Andre and we go. I mean, fuck this show. Hmm. People, uh, associate it with Blair Witch. But Blair Witch didn't actually invent the technique. And I think it's, it's worth bringing up one of his origin points. Um, I, I have heard it said, I don't know if it's like verified or verifiable, but um, I, I've heard it said that the origin point of that genre was actually this movie called Cannibal Holocaust, which uh, we, we can cover in just a minute. But first, need a nice hero shot of me coming down the ladder. So, uh, you first. Hmm. Cannibal Holocaust was this uh, Italian film from the late 70s. I think it probably came out in 79. Um, but same idea where it's like, oh, it's it's this like footage of a film crew. Oh, hey, Clancy. Uh, watch out, gore warning for anybody who's uh, sensitive to that. This game's going to have a lot of that, so you might not want to... You might not want to keep watching in general if, if you're really concerned about it. Um... Mysterious legs. Hmm. So that's that. Jesus. Hmm. For the sake of it, under normal circumstances, uh, there being a handle like this in a fireplace isn't that uncommon. Um, fireplaces have these these uh, shutter doors in them called flues. Like you've you've heard the term flu from like flu network in Harry Potter. Um, but ha having a lever to control the flu is not irregular. So um, it seems kind of weird, but the idea of like them co-opting its mechanism to do the door in some ways makes more sense or is like more believable than than some other kinds of house treatments but yeah cannibal holocaust was this film by a guy named lucio fulci um and it came out in the late 70s and was actually kind of like a phenomenon uh, it was super infamous for like how gory it was and how brutal it was and it also did this thing of like oh i accidentally sorry um really really infamous for how brutally gory it was um and it also did this thing where it kind of pretended to be real and had this, like, campaign of, like, trying to inspire some amount of doubt in the audience to, like, make it scarier. Um, and it was actually such an effective campaign, and maybe it was, like, so early into the history of, like, realistic gore effects that uh, the filmmakers of that film actually ended up going to trial. And they had to, like, prove to a judge that, like, they hadn't just filmed real-world violence. Um, 
and they had to like demonstrate how they did their effects to make to like prove that they had not made a snuff film um which to be f- oh you know what that wasn't you know what that wasn't lucio fulci i said the wrong name that's uh ruggiero deodato uh did this lucio fulci i'll mention in a minute for a different reason actually for for this but um the fact that there was some concern over it being real violence sounds a little bit ridiculous, but for the sake of it, I, I don't necessarily recommend watching the film. It's, it's brutally violent and incredibly unpleasant um, and pretty racist as well. Um, but uh, it actually does have some real violence in it, just not violence against people. It has, it has like several real animal killings, which are, are like pretty disturbing. Like they kill a giant tortoise and they kill a, uh, a monkey and a pig and a snake and a um what's it called it's a, it's kind of like a muskrat but it's not a muskrat um lucio fulci came to mind though because so lucio fulci was another italian horror director um who uh, also around the same time did this movie called zombie 2 um cannibal films in general like cannibal holocaust were part of this like sub trend of italian horror um of cannibal exploitation films, which were kind of a way to make cheap zombie films. Like if, if making a zombie film was too expensive to you, um, the way you get around having to do all of the practical effects for zombie makeup or whatever, is that you, uh, fly to South America and you like hire a bunch of people of color to put on grass skirts and you have them, uh, eat your protagonist rather than zombies. Cause that's like cheaper, um, and plays to, you know, extant uh, racial sentiments of the 1970s, uh, which is pretty gross. But Lucio Fulci did this other zombie film hmm, called Zombie 2, uh, which is kind of a, a big one. It was like one of the first after Dawn of the Dead. And uh, sir- circuitously, though, I'm getting to the point earlier, it, it, a, f- a few years later, he did another zombie film. Uh, that was called The Beyond, which also coincidentally takes place in Louisiana and also in its intro involves going into a basement and there's this like flooded passage of a basement. And um, I, I don't know if this sequence was like inspired by that early sequence in The Beyond. It's not part of the intro. It's technically, for, it's still first act, but it's not in the opening scenes. Um, but I have to wonder if, if this was part of that because houses in louisiana generally don't have basements because they tend to flood like this uh louisiana being in the bayou has a really really high water table so water uh showing up is not unexpected but besides treading through all this water they they also find a dead body in the water which we're about to do as we pass under this beam so jump scare warning as well so there's gonna be a dead body that pops out and it's all gross and decayed and that also happens in the movie the beyond which is also sort of this gothic horror thing so we have emerged and we see images of people and notes about them hmm we see this is not the room with the bed but we do see some some bars hmm We see as well, we see as well these big old sheets of wood that uh, have drawings of a, what looks like a mom and a dad and three kids, and then a bunch of text writing out. I'm sorry, daddy, I will not be bad anymore. I'm sorry, daddy, I will not be bad anymore. Spiraling into this corona. Um, this, as a motif, is going to show up in a lot of places. I think it's really, really interesting, though. Um, most players getting into this probably won't notice, but this this theme, this circle, um, shows up a lot in the game. Uh, and the sculpture that we already passed made of the cow's legs is kind of like this. And the hanging saw blades, I think, is also reference to this. Like, the, the circular saw blades, specifically, is this, like, circle. Like, the idea of this circle is, is very... Um, Specifically, like, a circle that's, like, radiating, I guess, is um, a motif that's going to show up in the game. And I, I think that's a really interesting and really cool thing. Um, I don't want to spoil 
too much, but like mold and decay are a big theme in this game. We've already seen mold around. Um, and the idea of, I think like a mold mycelium having like this central point from which there's all these outreaches um, by mycelia, um, I think is kind of where that symbol comes from. But I think, I'll, I, think I will cover that later. Uh, it's weird to record a video uh, of the first two hours of a game like after having played the entire game because I don't remember what are the other things that I have covered. Also a sheet of paper with notes. Ben, dead. Harold, turned. Arthur, turned. Tamara, turned. Craig, dead. Leela, dead. Sean, dead. William, dead. Travis, turned. Peter, dead. Andre, dead. Clancy, dead. Peter, Andre, and Clancy were all the... Uh, people on the video. Clancy is actually an L, not a dead. I misspoke, but L is very strange and different. Mia, no notes. Heidi turned, Clyde dead, Lindsay turned, Stephen turned, Nathaniel dead, Edward dead, uh, Nadine dead, Alex dead, Tom dead, Reed turned, Susan turned, Yosef dead, David dead. Uh, I've also speculated a little bit. I don't know how likely it is, but I do wonder if some of these are actually protagonists from like horror or zombie movies um i would need to like really dig like name by name to confirm one way or the other but the thing that always leapt out to me about this list was sean s-h-a-u-n reminds me of sean of the dead um peter is a character from dawn of the dead potentially ben is the main character of night of the living dead potentially um i'm trying to remember steven is another character from dawn of the dead um aka flyboy I, I would have to like go through the rest of the list, but there's a part of me that has wondered if if this is actually like a nod to like horror history in some capacity. Like it doesn't have it doesn't have an Ashley, does it? No, a Ashley would be an Evil Dead reference, certainly. Um, Ash Williams, but uh, to finish up the last point, yeah, the the Beyond is an interesting one, and I think is. Uh, like intimate to this game even if it wasn't on purpose i have no idea if the devs have actually seen it but um that's kind of a cool weird one that I, I actually recommend watching um unlike cannibal holocaust which is like weird and, and racist and very violent and very brutal and like if you want to watch it for like historical context because it is kind of an important film in its own way um go ahead but like it's not pleasant it's not like enjoyable it's a, it's a pretty rough film because of the animal killings uh there's sexual violence in the film as well um and that said it's kind of racist in a way that i think is kind of um it's kind of annoyingly racist I, I, that's like a weird term to throw out there but i feel like it, it does this thing where at the end of the film they kind of like try to moralize and sort of like turn it on its head and be like oh maybe we're the monsters all along um but it feels like kind of like it feels like you know that youtube thing of like it's just a prank bro or something like that you know like like doing a bunch of like shitty garbage and then uh attempting to say like oh it was all you know, none of it was legit, so that makes it okay that we did all of this bad stuff. Um, I don't think is like a real like fix. I found you. It's me. It's Ethan. 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 Are you all right? You shouldn't be here. What do you mean? You contacted me. No, no, I wouldn't. Did I? Did anyone see you? Did he see you? Hey, who else is here? What the hell's going on? Daddy's coming. We need to go. Daddy? We need to go now! Where are you taking me? Someplace safe. Are you gonna tell me what's going on? Baby, you've been gone for three years. Three years? Has it really been three years? <laughs> what? 
What is this place? What'd they do to you? Not now. We need to get out of here first. I think it's this way. Gross operating tables and what look to be clear plastic bags tied off and filled with guts. Mia, we Very have gross. To talk. That message you sent me. Not me. That wasn't me. But you did. I didn't. Okay, fine. Just tell me what's going on. I'm telling you everything that I know. We have to go this way. You know where you're going. Family used to bring me food through here. I remember. So one one funny thing I want to mention, I, I've noticed now like twice that these cans have a tendency to like the pile collapses when we get close to them. I don't think we're hitting them. I don't know if anyone is hitting them, but I think that it's. I have to wonder if like they're them being stacked up is like a model that kind of exists on its own and they only load in as like discrete physics objects when you get close enough to interact with them but like the arrangement that they're based on isn't stable enough for the physics objects to like there. maintain that it's there another door here. I'm sure of it. Hmm. It's not here. It's gone. It's gone! We're gonna be a family now that you're here. There's another door here. A picture labeled E-001. It's a picture of a creepy old lady. Hmm. I wonder what that means. Um, once again, sort of this white science, black magic thing. Old, old people are often sort of depicted in horror as being really scary. Like they have some forbidden knowledge or some connection to otherworldliness that young people do not, other than like young children. Um, speaking of which, we have dolls. Doll looks kind of like Mia. Doll of a little girl. Didn't Mia say that she was going out on a hmm didn't Mia say that she was going out on a babysitting gig and hmm a bunch of stacked up boards right here that sounded like boards moving there maybe there was a door behind some boards maybe there's a door hidden behind boards hmm we'll see yeah Indeed, there was one out there. We go back into the house. So this is going to be a sequence that I think is starting to lean a little bit more towards the Evil Dead referencing. E Evil Dead is the one that always gets brought up in the interviews, specifically um, always referencing Evil Dead itself, not Evil Dead 2, which is kind of the more well-known film. Uh, there is no Evil Dead 3, for the sake of saying it. The third film is called Army of Darkness. Uh, just out of... I, I'm not saying that to be pedantic. If you want to call Army of Darkness Evil Dead 3, that's fine. I just want to, like, if, if there's any question towards that. Um, e Evil Dead 2 is the more well-known of them. And I actually think that that has maybe more of a kinship to this game than... Than Evil Dead 1. Like, Evil Dead 1 got referenced because it's like, it's at this cabin, it's a really small number of characters total. I think there's only like five characters in that movie, uh, which is kind of what this game has. This game has, at least to the main story, if we exclude like the flashbacks and like the found footage or whatever, this game has six characters, something like that. The, you know, Mar Ethan and then six or seven i don't know so, something like that um 
Evil Dead 2, though, I do think has some kind of kinship to this game. There's one thing that's going to come up in just a moment that I'll bring up. But um, as, as I mentioned, um, this game is sort of a remake and a reboot and a sequel um, for the Resident Evil franchise. And that's also what Evil Dead 2 was, coincidentally. Maybe not coincidentally. Maybe that is entirely uh, consequential. Um, Evil Dead 2 is this weird thing that is not a direct sequel to the first Evil Dead, but, like, the first, like, 10 or 15 minutes of Evil Dead 2 is, like, a retelling of the events of the first film, kind of, which is really, really weird. Um, it's, it's weird that they would do that, but it's almost like in doing that, it's sort of remaking the film, but also, like, rebooting it so the outcomes are a little bit different, and then everything that continues after that is a sequel, so um, reboot and remake and sequel. Um, One of the other things that's really significant that I think connects this game to Evil Dead 2 in particular, although Evil Dead 1 has it, but, like, the intro to Evil Dead 2 especially, um, is, uh, this theme of man goes out to a cabin and has to fight possessed girlfriend. Hello, possessed girlfriend. Ow. Ow. That would hurt so bad. Wait. Wait. Yeah. In in Evil Dead, it's possessed by a demon. In this, I suppose we don't yet know. But th- this whole sequence feels very Evil Dead too to me. Mm. So, I've been bad seems to create the implication that she maybe wrote the I'm sorry, daddy. I promise not to be bad anymore. Hmm. But her reference was to her. Which is interesting because we haven't yet really had access to any other female characters in the story. Um, we, We saw photo of a little girl down a hallway a uh, photo of an old woman um, but the the creeper who we've seen around corners and in the video and whatever was definitely uh, like a middle aged dude she's okay We need to check the door first. Of course, she's going to get back up and... There we go. Her possession seems variable, because after we stabbed her, she seemed less possessed than before. Before we get the phone, I also want to mention, uh, <laughs> every time I've recorded this, every time I get thrown into this room, I always make mention of the fact these are called barrister shelves. I really like the look of barrister shelves. Uh, bookcases with glass doors in front of them, I think, are, are really beautiful. Um, one of the things I think is also really fascinating is that the the whole her on the stairs bit crawling up really reminds me a lot of Japanese horror um, or J horror, whatever you want to call it. Um, 
And the fact that this game is a Japanese-American co-production, I think, can't be understated. And I do wonder to what degree certain things were, like, selected or encouraged by one side versus the other. And that, to me, feels very, very Japanese horror. Though, you know, Japanese horror references could have very well been insisted upon by the American team or, or vice versa. So, uh, awkward joke about one missed call. You really shouldn't have come here. Who's this? Then what the fuck is going on? My name's Zoe. There should be a way out through the attic. Attic? Go there. Now. One missed call, is it? Japanese horror movie, so that was a joke, because I picked up the phone. Uh-oh. No more Mia. Get my axe back, though. Left a trail of blood. Yeah. And yeah. Nope. Okay, well, we have some bolt cutters now, so we have the ability to open that that case we went by to begin with. But yeah, the, the Evil Dead thing... Um, there's one other thing that happens on... Well, there's a couple other things that happen later on. Um, some fairly soon, some not so soon, that are like super, super, super obviously references to Evil Dead 2 in particular, not Evil Dead 1. Hmm. We got a fuse now, so time to go upstairs, but yeah. Nope. Hmm. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. But, like, in particular, later in the game, there's going to be, like, a direct reference to uh, the most famous line in Evil Dead 2. And uh, we're about to get another another Evil Dead 2 nod right here. Ethan, it's okay. It's okay. It's me. I don't believe you. I know you didn't mean to hurt You got something me. behind your hand, or behind your back. You shouldn't have done that! Yeah. It fucking hurts! That is the other Evil Dead 2 reference. So in Evil Dead 2, um, for those who don't know, uh, in, in Evil Dead 2, Ash gets his hand cut off, um, which I think th this feels very much like a reference to Evil Dead 2. Um, the the lo losing his hand to a chainsaw, no less. That is a specific thing. Though in Evil Dead 2, he cuts off his own hand um, rather than having it cut off, but his his hand is possessed. Um, he's trying to cut it off before it takes him over in whole. Um, if you couldn't hear, by the way, um, she had some audio that the game didn't subtitle, but she said, um, must contain the outbreak. It's my job. Um, going to burn it all down. It, that, that is, uh, kind of an interesting little hint towards where the story is going. Uh, that the game is, is sort of strangely decided to leave on unsubtitled. But we are, uh, I think, at the end of the first session now. I hope you all are enjoying this. I know it's kind of like a weird format, but it's actually something that I think could be really useful or really, really interesting. Um, not, not everyone's going to be into it. Not everyone uh, cares that much about hearing this kind of content. And, you know, we... You, if you stick with it, you'll see in some episodes I, I focus on it less and some I focus on it more. Um, but this is kind of a model for, for what this playthrough is. And uh, I, I do hope that people out there enjoy it. I, I hope that there's an audience for this kind of thing. Um, 
because I, I feel like it, it's something I would certainly watch if, if I found it, it you know so I'm, I'm gonna try to stick with this uh, this and episode two are gonna be a little bit better than the others because I've had practice so to speak in terms of like hitting a bunch of the talking points I want to hit but um, you know mo- moving forward I, w- I would love to kind of stick with this model e- even past Resident Evil 7 so uh, I hope you're enjoying and uh, we'll, we'll continue on with episode two in uh, just a few minutes after I've taken a break so thanks so much for watching uh, we'll, we'll maybe see you next time <laughs>